Hello and welcome. I'm Ashwarya joining you with a fresh new episode of A World Panorama where you get a complete roundup of all that happened in the world this week. Events that are changing our world and our future. Here is a look at the top stories first. UK government announces plans to suspend parliament, a gamble which could allow a no-deal Brexit to be forced through or preempt a vote of no confidence in the government. Massive increase in blazing fires in the Amazon rainforest. Brazil's President Jair Bolsonaro bans use of fire to clear land for 60 days. Angrily turns down $20 million aid pledged by world powers at the G7 summit to fight the fires. Two prominent pro-democracy leaders in Hong Kong taken into custody for their role in a protest on 21st of June, later released on bail. This as Hong Kong gears up for 13th consecutive weekend of mass anti-government demonstrations. Indonesia to relocate its capital Jakarta to a city in the island of Borneo, new yet to be named capital city in East Kalimantan, which is home to major mining activities as well as rainforests. And Johnson and Johnson ordered to pay $572 million in landmark opioid liability case. Pharma company found guilty of deceptive promotion of addictive painkillers. The top story this week, the UK government announced controversial plans to suspend Parliament on Wednesday morning. The Queen formally agreed Prime Minister Boris Johnson's request to end the current parliamentary session. The move limits the time opponents have to derail a disorderly Brexit, but also increases the chance that Johnson could face a vote of no confidence in his government and possibly an election. Remember, Britain is scheduled to leave the EU on 31st of October, but currently has not accepted a withdrawal agreement, which would lessen the shock of its departure. Demonstrators outside Britain's House of Parliament on Wednesday. They are enraged at British Prime Minister's decision to suspend Parliament for more than a month. Prime Minister Boris Johnson on Wednesday announced that he would set 14th of October for the Queen's speech, the formal state opening of a new session of Parliament that is preceded by a suspension of the House of Commons. That would effectively shut Parliament from mid-September for around a month. Prime Minister Johnson's move to cut short the current parliamentary session comes at a critical time, just ahead of the 31st of October Brexit deadline. Well, it's profoundly undemocratic. At a time of national crisis, Parliament must be able to meet, to hold the government to account, to represent our constituents, the electorate up and down the country. And it is profoundly undemocratic to shut Parliament down, to stop it doing its job at a time of national crisis like this. Critics say the suspension of UK Parliament means that MPs have much less time to debate Brexit. Some who want the UK to remain in the EU, even calling it a coup. Apart from angry backlash from MPs, Johnson's move has also led to a legal challenge and a petition with more than a million signatures. Prime Minister Johnson says that Britain will leave the European Union on 31st of October with or without a deal. However, opposition insists on leaving the EU with a deal. They say no deal would damage the British economy. They are threatening to call a vote of no confidence in the Johnson government. However, Johnson's ministers deny that the plan to suspend Parliament was a way of stopping Brexit debate. It's certainly not. The Prime Minister uh, is clear that he wants to use a new parliamentary session in order to ensure that the people's priorities are met. But it's also the case that parliamentarians will have plenty of time when we come back next week to debate Brexit. 
Johnson's move means that UK Parliament will wrap up by sometime around 10th of September and then will go into recess and return only on 14th of October, giving less time for the Brexit debate. However, if MPs pass a vote of no confidence before 10th of September, there could be a general elections in October. Remember, the UK was originally scheduled to leave the EU on 29th of March and after Parliament rejected the deal negotiated by the EU three times, that deadline was extended. The departure day is now 31st of October. Bureau report, Rajya Sabha TV. And there has been a massive increase in blazing fires in the Amazon rainforest. Brazil's President Ajir Bolsonaro has banned the use of fire to clear land throughout the country for 60 days. The ban comes after scientists warn that the fires, which have been raging at a record rate, could strike a devastating blow to the fight against climate change. The fires were also discussed at the recently held G7 summit in France, with the world powers are pledging $20 million aid for the Amazon to fight the fires. However, Brazil escalated its war efforts with the global powers, saying that it would turn down the aid offer. The sky over Brazil's largest city, Sao Paulo, is dark. Ash from forest fires in the Amazon rainforest blocked out the sun. In the forests that are called the lungs of the world, blazes are still rampaging. The record number of fires intensified an unfolding environmental crisis. A few charred trees are all that remain in this patch of the Amazon. After French President Emmanuel Macron last week described the fires as an international crisis, the issue was discussed at the G7 summit in France, and it was announced that $22 million would be released primarily to pay for the more firefighting planes. And France also pledged support with military in the region. We have had a discussion with US President Donald Trump about the situation in the Amazon. He shares the objectives that we are following and that have been reflected in the G7 summit initiative. President Trump spoke to Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro on the phone and other presidents from the region as well. As tens of thousands of fires engulfed the Amazon, Facing mounting pressure from abroad, Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro authorized the military to help tackle the blazes. Government saying 44,000 soldiers had been deployed. However, the Brazilian government rejected an offer of aid from G7 countries, saying that Macron must first apologize. Bolsonaro has accused the French president of colonialism and imperialism, saying that the G7 leaders were trying to save the Amazon as if it were a colony. Do you think someone helps someone else to not be poor without something in return? Why do they have their eye on the Amazon? What do they want there? Wildfires often occur in the dry season in Brazil, but satellite data has shown an increase of 85% this year. Neighboring Bolivia is also struggling to contain fires burning in its rainforests. International condemnation against Bolsonaro continues. Thousands of protesters have also taken to the streets across the world, calling on governments to interfere. Critics have also accused Bolsonaro of making deforestation worse in the Amazon through anti-environmental rhetoric. He has also been accused of emboldening miners and loggers who deliberately start fires to deforest land illegally. Many also point at years of slashing government budgets for the environment and Brazil's strong agriculture sector that has rushed up the pressure on forests. We believe that the position of the Brazilian President Bolsonaro is inciting the producers to start fires in the Amazon. It happens every year in the Amazon. We haven't seen this type of fire before Bolsonaro. As the largest rainforest in the world, the Amazon is a vital carbon store that slows down the pace of global warming. 
It spans a number of countries, but the majority of it falls within Brazil. It is also known as the lungs of the world for its role in absorbing carbon dioxide and producing oxygen. The rainforest is also home to about 3 million species of plants and animals and 1 million indigenous people. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabhati. Two prominent uh, pro-democracy leaders in Hong Kong have been arrested. Both their arrests were related to a protest on 21st of June, which saw protesters blockade police headquarters for 15 hours. However, the two were released on bail later. The developments came as a Hong Kong gears up for the 13th consecutive weekend of mass anti-government demonstrations. Meanwhile, China has added fresh military troops to the Hong Kong garrison, which it says was simply a military rotation. But it demonstrates how tense the city is ahead of another weekend of anti-government protests. Amid the simmering unrest in Hong Kong, the crackdown continues. On Friday, two prominent Hong Kong pro-democracy activists, Joshua Wong and Agnes Chow, were arrested. Police say these two face charges of inciting and participating in an unauthorized assembly in relation to an incident on June 21st when protesters besieged the police headquarters. However, Hong Kong residents say arrest of democracy activists was a political move these detentions comes a day ahead of a planned demonstration scheduled for this weekend. Police have declined permission for the rally. We believe that uh, the, the high-profile uh, arrest before the uh, 31st of August uh, protest is because they want to spread right terror towards the Hong Kong protester and the Hong Konger. Wong's detention comes two weeks before he was due to travel to Washington, D.C. to attend a hearing on the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act. Experts feel Wong and Chao's arrest could be a part of wider crackdown. Some 900 people have been arrested since protests began in early June, triggered by a controversial extradition bill. With the bill now suspended, the rallies have evolved into a broader movement demanding democratic reform and an investigation into alleged police brutalities. On Thursday, Chinese military vehicles were seen moving across the border into Hong Kong. The military said it was a regular troop movement. However, fear arise that the city could see Beijing lit crackdown after months of political unrest. The rotation of the garrison and equipment will further enhance the capability of fulfilling the duty of defense forces in Hong Kong. We will firmly follow the orders of the Communist Party and the Central Military Commission, resolutely implement the one country, two system policy, as well as the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region Basic Law. The military deployment came despite Hong Kong leader Carrie Lam on Tuesday insisted that her administration has not lost control, adding the spiraling unrest could be handled without Beijing's force intervening. She also ruled out stepping down. I think a responsible chief executive at this point in time should continue to hold the fort and do her utmost to restore law and order in Hong Kong. Okay? And I wouldn't say that uh, my government has lost control. Wong and Chao's arrests are certain to exacerbate political tensions in Hong Kong which was retroceded to China in 1997 but remains politically, culturally, linguistically distinct from the rest of the country. Current protests is concerned about what is perceived to be China's increasing influence in Hong Kong. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha TV. Indonesian President Joko Widodo has announced that the country will relocate its capital Jakarta to a new city in the island of Borneo. The new capital city has not been named as yet, but government expects to begin moving in to the new capital city in the East Kalimantan province in 2024. Taking on the concerns of overcrowding, pollution and income disparity in Jakarta, the move also hopes to address issues of extreme land subsistence. However, environmentalists say that the capital city move could threaten endangered species. As Kalimantan is home to rainforests, it is one of the few places on earth with orangutans in their natural habitat.
Indonesia will soon have a new capital city. The national capital will move from Jakarta to a yet to be built city in the province of East Kalimantan, which is more than 1000 kilometers away. President Joko Widodo announced this on Monday. Moving the capital was a plan suggested by various Indonesian presidents over decades. Widodo said the new capital city will already have relatively complete infrastructure because it is near two cities. However, the new capital city has not been named as yet. The government has been conducting studies and we intensified the studies in the past 3 years. The result of the studies conclude that the ideal location of the new capital is part of the north of Panjampesa and the part of Kutai Karta Negara in East Kalimantan province. Decades of discussions about building a new capital on Borneo Island moved forward in April when Widodo approved a general relocation plan. He appealed for support for the move in an annual national address on the eve of Indonesia's Independence Day on 16th of August. A bill for the proposed move will now be presented to parliament and if approved construction could start next year. Moving the capital is expected to cost 32.7 billion dollars. Widodo says the relocation is about addressing inequality and relieving some of the burden on Jakarta. Jakarta is struggling under huge environmental burden as well. Indonesia's capital is also sinking. Areas of North Jakarta, including the sea wall designed to protect them, are falling at an estimated 25 cm a year due to subsistence. Go bencana minimal. Baik. The place has minimum risk for natural disasters such as floods, earthquakes, tsunami, forest fires, volcanoes and landslides secondly the location is strategic as it is located in the center of indonesia and thirdly it is close to other developed cities yang ketiga berdekatan dengan wilayah perkotaan yang sudah berkembang However, the relocation has raised other pertinent questions. Kalimantan is home to major mining activities as well as rainforests and is one of the few places where orangutans live in their natural habitat. The government has promised that the environmental impact will be positive and protected forests will be rehabilitated. But there are fears that the plan and the increased number of people living on the island will have serious environmental impacts. with the environmentalist saying the relocation needs to be carefully handled or it will result in leaving one ecologically damaged area only to create another indonesia is not the first southeast asian country to move its capital myanmar and malaysia have both moved their seat of government elsewhere in the world brazil pakistan australia and nigeria are among the nations that have also shifted their capital cities bureau report rajasabha tv And here is a look at some international news stories in Global Buzz. Monday concluded the three-day summit held in France by the Group of Seven or G7, which is composed of the most two advanced economies in the world: France, Canada, Germany, Japan, Italy, UK, and the US. At the summit, French President Emmanuel Macron invited Iranian President Hassan Rouhani and said that he had told him that he was open to a meeting with US President Donald Trump. Donald Trump also told a news conference before heading home that it was realistic to envisage a meeting with the Iranian head of government in the coming weeks. Both leaders are scheduled to attend the United Nations General Assembly next month. Italy's caretaker prime minister Giuseppe Conte has accepted a mandate to form a new coalition with a vow to lead a more united inclusive Italy. This comes a week after the collapse of his government dominated by nationalists. He said that Italy should play a leading role in Europe, a marked change from the policies of the right-wing league. League leader Matteo Salvini had triggered the downfall of the previous coalition. His partner Five Star has now reached a deal with the center left after president gave him a mandate to form a new coalition he said that Italy had to make up for the lost time as it was in a very delicate phase Brad Pitt, Liv Tyler and Ruth Negga brought star power 
to the Venice Surf Film Festival red carpet on Thursday as they premiered their space epic Ad Astra. Scarlett Johansson also dazzled on the red carpet for the world premiere of Marriage Story. She and her co-star Adam Driver delighted fans with autographs and selfies and they were joined in by actor Laura Dern and director and producer of the movie and other glamorous guests. Meanwhile, lush Spanish director Pedro Almodovar added a golden lion for lifetime achievement to his list of accolades when the Venice Film Festival presented him with a prize for a long and illustrious career. The 76th Venice Film Festival got underway on 28th of August with a star-studded red carpet showcasing some of the finest talent that cinema has to offer. The festival will run till 7th of September. News uh, from the U.S. now. Drug maker Johnson & Johnson has been asked to pay $572 million for its role in uh, Oklahoma's opioid addiction crisis. The judge in the ruling said that Johnson & Johnson ran a false and dangerous sales campaign that led to addiction and death in the state as well as uh, helping to fuel the worst drug epidemic in the U.S. history. The case was the first to go on trial out of thousands of lawsuits filed against opioid makers and distributors. The company, however, says it will appeal against the verdict. historic ruling in the United States, drug maker Johnson & Johnson has been asked to pay $572 million fine for its role in Oklahoma's opioid addiction crisis. The judge of Cleveland County District Court in Oklahoma found the company guilty of deceptive promotion of its highly addictive painkillers. The opioid crisis has ravaged the state of Oklahoma. It must be abated, abated immediately. For this reason, I am entering an abatement plan that consists of costs totaling $572,102,028 to immediately remediate the nuisance. So, what are opioids and what led to opioid crisis? Opioids are a class of drugs that include the illegal drug heroin, synthetic opioids and pain relievers available legally by prescription. In the late 1990s, pharmaceutical companies reassured the medical community that the patients would not become addicted to prescription opioid pain relievers. As a result, doctors began to prescribe them at greater rates. This led to the misuse of these medications and it also came to fore that these medications could indeed be highly addictive. Today, every day, more than 130 people in the US die after overdosing on opioids. A slew of lawsuits have been filed against opioid manufacturers and distributors throughout the US. And this is the first time that an opioid manufacturer has been deemed responsible in court and made to pay damages. At the end of the day, uh, you can't sit in a corporate suite somewhere for the last 20 years and oversupply the country. Uh, Ten times more of this drug was coming in, and then you had, concomitantly, 15 times more people dying from opioid overdoses. So there's no question in my mind that uh, these companies knew what was going on at the highest level. Um, they just couldn't quit making money from it, and that's why they're responsible. Johnson & Johnson, which brought in revenue of more than $81 billion last year, say they will be appealing the judgment. We have sympathy for all who suffer from substance abuse. But Johnson & Johnson did not cause the opioid abuse crisis here in Oklahoma or anywhere in this country. 
The most important takeaway from Oklahoma trial was the judge's conclusion that Johnson and Johnson wasn't merely a negligent bystander, but that it on purpose engaged in deceptive conduct. The judge said in his ruling that Johnson and Johnson engaged in a false, misleading, and deceptive marketing campaign designed to convince Oklahoma doctors, patients, and the public at large that opioids were safe and effective for the long-term treatment of chronic pain. The ruling comes at a crucial time as big pharma companies are targeting India's booming opioid market as well. Bureau report, Rajasabha TV. And before we go, here is a look at the canine beach race in Croatia. Almost two dozen dogs accompanied by their owners competed in what has become a traditional end-of-summer race hosted by one of Croatia's few dog-friendly beaches. The race includes a short running and swimming course. The fastest dog owner tandems win special treats such as a canine wine and ice cream. The event also included a competition for dogs for the fastest ice cream eating and drinking of canine wine. So take a look at the competing canines and their owners. I'll see you next week in another edition of World Panorama. Bye-bye.